thanks everybody for joining us. And I think uh, I think uh, <laughs> Sharon is introducing us, but I think she might be on mute. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Matt. I had this great introduction that uh, apparently no one heard, so <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, well, welcome. My name is Sharon Pillar, the Executive Director and Founder of the Pennsylvania Solar Center, and we have a great lineup today. Thank you for being here with us, um, and, and including with me is my colleague, Matt Mahoney, the Director of Government Affairs. So we're going to dive in. I just want to show you a little bit about um, a little bit about us. Um, first of all, we're being joined by Dave Enger of the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission, Garrett Strunk of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, Chad, uh, or sorry, Kevin Wright of Protogen Energy, and Chad Fitzgerald of EOS Energy Storage. So a little bit about the Pennsylvania Solar Center. Um, I think a lot of you have joined us before, but if you haven't, we are a nonprofit organization that's working across the state. Our goal and vision is that Pennsylvania becomes a leader in renewable energy through the rapid and broad expansion of in-state solar and storage. Um, we will accomplish this by providing trusted guidance to usher all Pennsylvanians into the clean energy economy. And part of our mission and vision is that we want to create more resilient communities. And that is a very um, important topic of today's um, a webinar. We can't do that without the a storage as well. So uh, we're very thankful for our funders. We have a great number of funders and it's growing. And if you or your company want to be a part of this list, we would welcome you and uh, very grateful for the support that helps our work uh, move forward every day in Pennsylvania. We say that we work to transform, educate, and advocate. And we do that through our technical assistance program, our education and outreach, and our policy education. Our technical assistance program, some of you know as the Get Solar program. And we have several iterations of that where we will provide technical direct assistance to any entity in the commercial sector. So that includes non nonprofits, municipalities, businesses, faith communities, libraries, you know, basically any non-residential entity. We have a team of three people that actually will help guide your organization through that whole uh, feasibility to putting out your project to an RFP. And we now have about 150 projects in our queue. Um, and we're hoping that we'll be hiring a few more people here um, by the end of the year. So if you want to join our team, look out for some new um, job descriptions about the team. And we also have our Get Solar Communities where we're working directly with communities and helping them identify the, these um, businesses or commercial entities, uh, nonprofits that might be interested in going solar. solar. So uh, we'll be expanding that program as well. And we're working on our Solar for Schools program. Uh, we have about 20 schools that are in our queue right now. And this is a great opportunity for schools to save money by going solar. And we also have, of course, our education, such as our webinar series here today. We have a monthly newsletter. If you're not getting that, please sign up on our website and a solar directory uh, of developers across the state and many other things. And of course, we have our policy work that Matt and I are working very closely in Harrisburg. We have a solar legislation guide that walks you through every piece of legislation in Pennsylvania that's related to solar. And this is a really important piece of the work that we do. This, this particular legislative session, which we're almost done with the first year of the two-year session, is to increase Pennsylvania's renewable energy goals by 30% by 2030. And Matt's going to talk a little bit more about these in depth. We also would like to see enable, enabling uh, community solar, which we don't have in Pennsylvania, and of course, defending against unfriendly solar policies. And with that, I will turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Matt Mahoney. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Sharon. And uh, thank you all for joining us today to have this conversation about energy storage and the importance of, uh, uh, of these technologies to support resilience on the grid. 
Um, before diving into the content, just wanted to provide a quick legislative update. Uh, so um, as you all know, uh, uh, the Alternative Energy Portfolio Standard in Pennsylvania was signed into law in 2004 and represents uh, one of the strongest pieces of policy that have support, that supported renewable energy growth in Pennsylvania. Um, as of 2021, though, those goals have been met and we don't have any more inc inc increasing goals uh, for more renewables or more solar to come online or not much more incentive, rather, uh, as compared to other states. If you take a look at the map uh, where we see New York and New Jersey, Virginia, many states in our area uh, in the region uh, have advanced much stronger goals. Uh, and it's time for Pennsylvania to catch up. Um, just a quick overview of what the APS is, the Alternative Energy Portfolio Standard uh, provides two tiers uh, for uh, uh, alternative energy sources. So utilities must source uh, electricity from these various sources. Uh, so in tier one, uh, we see the 8% must come from solar, thermal, wind, uh, and hydro, geothermal and biomass and fuel cells. And then tier two, where uh, it's mostly large scale hydro and waste coal. Um, going off to the uh, next slide, um, uh, we start to, uh, as we're talking about the need for modernizing the alternative energy portfolio standard, I wanted to describe one of the uh, important incentives and uh, 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 incentives that's a piece of the alternative energy portfolio standard and has been enabled by the AEPS uh, and provides a real value to customers across the uh, solar, uh, solar value chain. Um, so just I'll go through this quickly. It does look confusing, but if we start at the top, uh, uh, we see that when when any of those alternative energy sources that I mentioned previously, the solar, wind, geothermal, whenever they generate what is called one megawatt hour of electricity, uh, they create that creates one credit, one solar alternative energy credit, or uh, often referred to as an SREC, uh, solar renewable energy credit. Those credits uh, are then uh, can then be bought and sold. Uh, for revenue or uh, for uh, uh, financing and funding uh, projects. So once one credit is created, uh, that, that is then uh, bundled with other credits uh, via an SREC aggregator. So going on to number two, uh, and those SRECs are then sold uh, to utilities via a, big, uh, a marketplace. So the marketplace, the prices fluctuate based on supply and demand. When those utilities buy those uh, credits as they're required to by law, uh, that money goes uh, through the aggregator and then resulting goes to the system owner, the person, the entity that owns that solar uh, system. And you can see at number four, that aggregator pays out based on the size of a three kilowatt system, which is a, a, a typical household uh, uh, system, would pay about $105 for a year. So as, as you can imagine, as it gets larger, uh, the larger system, more credits, more revenues generated. So uh, next slide. Based on the goals uh, of where we are right now with uh, Pennsylvania at that 0.5%, we're, we're, our current goal in Pennsylvania is 0.5% solar. And that's what the line, the flat line uh, on uh, this chart represents is that 0.5% of uh, solar that's required to be purchased by utilities in Pennsylvania. But we see that yellow line is starting to go above what our requirements are. And so these numbers are actually a bit out of date. Uh, this is based on a 2022 uh, AEPS report uh, uh, that's reported every year uh, by the public with uh, uh, the Public Utility Commission. Um, but that number is increasing. And with that number increasing, uh, we're seeing uh, the prices of those credits starting to drop. Uh, and if we go to the next slide, we'll see that uh, based on uh, a publicly available resource, uh, SREC Trade um, provides the market prices for uh, for SRECs over the past 12 months, we could see that because of this oversupply now uh, and no action being taken on the alternative energy portfolio standard, meaning the goal, that flat line, there's, it's no longer going up. The trajectory is no longer going up for requirements. So as that as more solar comes online, the SREC value is starting to and will continue to deteriorate. And that's a big problem because that's a, an important incentive for many solar owners. Uh, and so it's in paramount uh, for the legislature to take action to move uh, forward uh, legislation uh, that improves and modernizes the alternative energy portfolio standard. Um, another reason, onto the next slide, 
uh, is Pennsylvania's electricity mix is becoming less diverse. Uh, and when it, when it becomes less diverse, we could become more susceptible to uh, impacts from all the other markets. So uh, with uh, Pennsylvania's electricity mix, uh, uh, right now close to 50%, uh, over 50%, uh, generation coming from natural gas, whenever there are disruptions to the natural gas markets, they're going to have significant impacts on electricity prices, as we saw in the summer of 2022, uh, when uh, the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission reported that uh, wholesale market prices uh, were fueled in large part by shifts in supply and demand for natural gas, and those have direct impacts on consumers. So what are the solutions? What are the answers? What's the, uh, what's the path forward? Uh, so uh, that would be House Bill 1467, Senate Bill 230. So uh, House Bill 1467 would increase the tier one goal from 8% to 30%. So we would meet that 30% by 2030 goal that we mentioned earlier. It would also enable community solar, which currently is not available in Pennsylvania, uh, and provides a community solar program that uh, ensures uh, 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 ensures uh, consumer protection uh, and uh, ensures that we're uh, using a model that is is has been used for uh, uh, over or for nearly two decades in, in Pennsylvania, a trusted uh, uh, policy like the alternative energy portfolio standard. Um, that's where community solar belongs. Uh, and then also it treats each of the solar markets resp respectfully uh, by uh, uh, creating uh, carve-outs, three categories within the solar carve-out. So 4% for customer generators, 2% for those community solar uh, projects, and 8% for grid scale. So we're ensuring that grid scale, community solar, and uh, customer generators, rooftop solar, there aren't competing against each other. Uh, and further harming uh, the SREC costs. Uh, this next slide just shows a breakout of the uh, of the percentage increases and where the other 16%, I, I focused on the 14% uh, that would come from solar, the other 16% would be those other tier one resources, uh, the wind, geothermal, biomass, et cetera, uh, that I've mentioned uh, previously. Uh, but this just helps break down where those increases are uh, would come from uh, and would help us uh, uh, ensure the diversity on our grid and ensure uh, a strong SREC market uh, for customers and uh, for solar customers and for the solar industry and for the renewable energy industry in Pennsylvania. And so with that bill, we want to see that bill pass. We're working very hard to see that pass. Uh, and this is why, because once we get that, once we boil it all down, um, uh, we're, we're really making a long-term investment uh, that creates more return uh, than the investments. Billions in, in uh, economic development opportunity, lease payments for farmers, ensuring that family ownership uh, uh, of those farms stays in family farms' hands. Uh, uh, labor income, wholesale electricity prices start to reduce once we reach uh, certain uh, penetrations of solar. Uh, all we need to do is take action and move solar policy forward, strong solar policy forward, so we can uh, uh, realize these benefits, uh, start realizing the economic incentive and benefits and, and drive Pennsylvania's renewable energy industry forward. So how can folks take action? Just real quick before we drive into the, uh, the content of the material we're here to discuss, um, take action. Uh, the top QR code there, if uh, you have your phone, uh, take a quick picture of that top QR code and that's an action alert. Uh, that you can let your legislators know right now uh, that you support House Bill 1467 and Senate Bill 230 uh, to do the things that we just discussed, uh, in, uh, increase the renewable goals uh, to 30% by 2030, uh, enable community solar, uh, and ensure that uh, the, the solar market, the solar uh, uh, sectors, or the um, uh, uh, that community solar, distributed solar, and utility scale solar uh, each uh, uh, are, are supported through the AEPS. So with that, uh, I hope you'll take action, but uh, I'd like to transition now and introduce our first speaker, uh, who's uh, David Edinger. Uh, Dave works in the policy and planning section of the technical utility services at the Pennsylvania Public Utility Commission as a fixed utility financial analyst. Boy, Dave, that's a, a mouthful. <laughs> oh boy, is it ever. <laughs> we deal in uh, acronym soup over here. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, Dave's going to provide us with an overview of the recently proposed policy statement order on electricity storage. Mm -hmm. uh, and the PUC is seeking comments on that now. It has been published in the Pennsylvania uh, Bulletin. But uh, Dave, thanks for joining us and looking forward to, uh, to hearing your overview. 
Sure. Uh, thank you, Matt. And uh, thank you, Sharon. Uh, I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to speak uh, to everybody here. Uh, I, um, I hope everyone is enjoying the last full day of summer as we go into autumnal equ equinox tomorrow, which means um, uh, less sunlight. And I think that's very apropos to this group. Um, Anyway, uh, I, I don't have a presentation, so I will try to be a bit more animated when you're looking at my face here on the screen. Um, but I'm just going to provide a quick overview of the energy storage policy that uh, is now published in the Pennsylvania Bulletin, as Matt said. Um, and so uh, just give it a little bit of a history and sort of what, um, what it's about. So... Uh, a little bit of background. In December of 2020, the PUC initiated a proceeding to gather um, input regarding the use of electricity storage on the distribution grid uh, in order to enhance reliability and resiliency. So initially, there were three questions asked, which really there were kind of five questions. A couple of the questions were tagged on there, but um, they asked, uh, you know, what benefits to the distribution grid can electric storage provide? What are the defining characteristics of electric storage for distribution planning? What are the thresholds for electric storage that would move it out of the realm of distribution asset and into the realm of a generation asset? Um, is it prudent to include electric storage in distribution planning and under what circumstances? And finally, is it appropriate for utilities to include these investments in the rate base? Um, so that initial um, cadre of questions that we asked, we got comment, we received comments from nearly 30 different stakeholders. And these, the comments were very well thought out and went into great detail um, uh, to answer those questions. And honestly, uh, went into some realms that um, perhaps we hadn't considered. So um, this began a second round of questions. And in August of 21, the commission issued a, a, the second round of questions. Um, and the intent of the second round was sort of to give us clarity and provide us better direction in order to sculpt a policy statement that would um, reflect the goals of the state and, you know, the wishes um, uh, of the stakeholders and to get points of view that we may not have considered. So I won't go over those questions, but uh, needless to say, we received comments from 16 different stakeholders on that second round of questioning. Um, and if some of you who are on this webinar provided comments, I want to say thank you very much for your input. It was very valuable. Um, and so that brings us to where we're at today. So on the August 24th public meeting uh, agenda, the proposed policy statement was, um, was voted on and uh, issued. And so uh, as Matt said, this actually is going, well, it's out already, but the comment period on this starts tomorrow. Uh, September 23rd, and anybody who wishes to get a last bite of the apple to provide comments on this policy statement will have until October 23rd, and then there's a 45-day comment period, which means 45 days from the date it is put into the Pennsylvania Bulletin, and if my calculations are correct, that puts it at November 7th for reply comments on this. Um, and interesting enough, I mean, the, um, the electricity storage, though it does does not deal with behind the meter storage at all. It is only, uh, it, it's only dealing with the realm of electric distribution companies using it on the distribution grid. So um, not behind the meter storage. However, um, where this I think butts up against um, uh, solar and and where it, it's prescient is the fact that um, uh, with increasing de distributed energy resources or DERs on the distribution grid in certain areas, it create it can create uh, problems for voltage um, for voltage support and providing good clean power um, back into the grid. And you know we all know that um, and electricity storage, battery storage um, uh, can provide a myriad of functions. But one of these functions that it can provide is voltage support. And so that's really what. Um, you know, what the value of uh, energy storage on the distribution grid is. And so the policy statement is not very prescriptive and does not address a lot of the issues that uh, some of the commenters had brought up. Um, but it what it does state is that the commission believes that it is a, uh, a good resource for um, reliability and resiliency on the distribution grid and that uh, that electric distribution companies 
uh, should consider it as a possible cost-effective um, solution and another tool in the toolbox for them to resolve any of these reliability and resiliency issues. So that's where we're at with that. So um, it's been a long road, a lot of discussions and uh, a lot of input and a lot of really interesting points have been brought up. So again, you'll get your last bite of the apple to provide comments on this and I welcome any comments. Um, on behalf of the commission, we welcome any comments. Um, and so, yeah, the clock will be starting tomorrow. So thank you very much. Well, thanks so much, David. And that's, uh, that's a really helpful overview. I think, uh, uh, you know, whenever we see the, uh, the PUC uh, press release and announcement, it makes the, the, war, the, the wheels start to grind and, and <laughs> folks start to think, uh, what does this all mean? So uh, it's great to have uh, a condensed version of what it does all mean. And, uh, uh, and, and comments will be uh, 30 days uh, following its publication tomorrow. So uh, uh, nearing the end of October is when, so uh, anybody who's interested. So thanks so much, David, appreciate that. Uh, and um, I don't see any questions, but if you do have questions, please do put them in the Q&A uh, and we'll get them get to them as, as soon as we can. But uh, moving right along with our agenda, um, we're going to uh, move on to uh, sticking with energy storage, Pennsylvania, uh, did complete an energy uh, uh, or energy storage assessment in 2021, uh, and we're joined today by Garrett Strunk uh, of the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection, uh, who is uh, who works in the Energy Programs Office. Um, uh, Garrett's going to provide us with an overview of the energy storage more broadly here in Pennsylvania, based on that 2021 assessment, uh, uh, and uh, tell us a little bit more about the storage status, uh, barriers, and opportunities. So, uh, Garrett, I'll let you take it away from here. Sure. Thanks, Matt. So yeah, my name is Garrett Strunk. I'm a energy program specialist here at the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection Energy Programs Office. Um, and I'm here to give you an overview of kind of where we are with energy storage in the eyes of the Energy Programs Office. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, presentation was made in, well, released anyway, in 2021 with partnership with uh, the Department of Environmental Protection and Stratagen. Um, this is, I'll say, a summary of the actual energy assessment that we um, that we conducted with them. And I'll, uh, I can provide a link to that. I realize it's actually not in this presentation. I realized that about 15 minutes ago. So I can, uh, I can provide that if you're interested. Um, but next slide, please. So this is an abbreviated version of this presentation because I'm trying to fit this into 15 minutes here. And excuse me, I'm getting over COVID right now. So if I sound kind of stuffy, I apologize. Um, so we'll go through um, some technologies and applications kind of in general, just to make sure everyone's aware of what storage can mean. Um, where we are in storage and with Pennsylvania today, um, the analysis of what was done in this actual analysis and kind of try to try to summarize it the best I can in this short amount of time. Um, and then go over the barriers and uh, some policy recommendations that uh, we came up with along the way. So I wanted to give you an idea of what the EPO actually is first, just to frame the conversation. So the Energy Programs Office sits within the Department of Environmental Protection. We are the state energy office in the eyes of the federal Department of Energy. Um, so we get federal dollars for from the Department of Energy to actually go distribute and, and do good things with. Um, that could be rebates, that could be education programs, that could be analyses like these to kind of better educate our policymakers on what we need to be doing. Um, but ultimately, we're really trying to handle all things energy and energy conservation, as well as renewable energy um, for the state of Pennsylvania. Next slide, please. So I just kept this in here just so you're aware that Stratagen was um, our partner in this. Uh, they do they did a lot of good work for us, and uh, we uh, definitely appreciate their their time with us and helping us develop this assessment. Next slide. Okay, so uh, this is actually the cover page of um, our analysis and really wanted to give you an idea of what why we did this in the first place. Um, back pre-2021 and frankly before my time with DEP, um, we, we, the office, kind of realized that storage was going to be an absolutely necessary thing to meet our, I'll say, long-term um, 
renewable energy goals and and really was going to be an integral part of re the revitalizing the grid and kind of everything that we need to talk about there. Um, so this analysis kind of set the stage for, first off, understanding where we even are today, what, what kind of storage is out there and what are the things that are really holding it back from growing. Um, and then uh, analyzing really the couple use cases of where uh, we think we could have some immediate benefit or things that would need to probably be on the forefront of the minds of the citizens um, of the Commonwealth. And then additionally, as I said before, uh, that did overview some uh, policy recommendations as well so that uh, the, the DEP could help influence policy because the DEP doesn't actually make policy um, with the our rest of our policy fellows in the, in the state government as well. Um, because really, we feel that as the government, the government body um, policy is going to be a large portion of of the effort needed um, to make this change. So I'll give a quick overview of technologies and their applications. So. I'll be kind of brief on this because I think the I think the audience is at least semi aware of what energy storage is. But uh, I know a lot of consumers view energy storage as batteries or things like that that are off that are behind the meter um, and and things that uh, they they would be interfacing with on a daily basis. But that's not that's not all. Um, Pennsylvania specifically is actually quite ahead of the game in some some ways. Um, uh, because we have two large uh, pumped hydro plants, um, in that way there's different ways that we can actually use energy storage. It's not just batteries, like I said, pumped hydro, compressed air, um, and things like that. Of the categories that we're highlighting here, uh, we broke them down into mechanical, electrochemical, think of those as batteries, um, thermal, electrical, and chemical as well. Um, chemical can really be considered hydrogen in a lot of ways, because that's really the, the hot topic of what we're talking about in, in today's world. Um, but ultimately, storage should be thought about as kind of like a broad way of taking generated power and storing it away for later use, not necessarily just one specific technology. Next slide, please. So this slide, I, I will not talk in detail about this, and you'll kind of see this is a theme for this presentation. This is a very detailed overview of, of this of this assessment. Um, but what I'd like to point out here is I think a lot of citizens specifically think about um, storage at, at it's most easy to think about at the, at the customer level, which is absolutely a, a very a very uh, valid use of storage. But there is also different uses at the distribution and transmission levels of the state when, when it comes to modernizing the grid um, as David was talking about matching voltage using using storage is something that is already something that is pretty feasible. Um, but as a general statement, uh, energy storage applications are broad at pretty much every point of the grid from from generation to user. Um, and this assessment touches on all of that. I'm not going to touch on all of that here because I could talk for hours on this. Um, but just want to know that kind of broaden the broaden everyone's minds to know that this this assessment was quite broad in our stroke. Next slide, please. <coughs> Excuse me. So just to highlight some of the potential benefits of energy storage, I think this is kind of a good slide to point out some of the main things that can be good talking points to why we should be pushing storage forward. Um, I know David talked about this, but grid resiliency, reliability, and flexibility. This is something that is immediate that um, can be a benefit. Um, I know Kevin's intimately familiar with this concept too, in terms of microgrids. Um, it's another thing that we can use them to integrate and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, there can be, uh, there can be uh, energy produced off of peak hours that can be stored and used during peak hours. I'll kind of have a slide that actually hits on that later, but that's what just one use of that. Um, in addition, I'm, I know I'm limited on time, so I'm not going to go through all these details, but there's a numerous benefits to energy storage. It's just a matter of getting uh, the economics there to make it make sense. Next slide. So where are we in Pennsylvania today? This is a pretty abbreviated section, but I'll try to give you a quick overview of what we're where we are. Um, so as just again, this was a as of 2021, this has changed a little bit since then. Um, but uh, I did mention that we do have pumped hydro here in Pennsylvania. We have about 1.07 gigawatts of uh, 
pumped hydro output that we have. We also have um, lithium ion batteries, lead carbon batteries, thermal storage and lead acid batteries that in total add up to about 40 megawatts in addition to the gigawatts, uh, the one gigawatt that we get from the pumped hydro. Um, there's, so it's, I'll, I'll say there's some barriers that we're going to go over later that, that are prohibiting this from growing and we'll talk about some of the solutions or, or at least some ideas that we can uh, use to push forward some of this growth but we do know as we probably this group is very well aware of there's increasing support for renewable energy um, and uh, the Pennsylvania solar future goal of 10 percent by 2030 is only going to be helped by having um, by having storage to uh, offset some of that uh, peak hour stuff next slide please So this is a pretty wordy slide. I'm actually going to focus on the pie graph on the right. Um, as of 2021, when um, we looked into the solar projects in the PJM queue, um, about 258 of those projects were just solar, but 64 were actually proposed with solar plus storage, which to me was actually kind of surprising. Um, so our goal is to try to incentivize, or I shouldn't even say incentivize, just uh, update the market, re refine the market to um, to make that number go up. I mean, we feel that storage and having storage on the grid is something that's going to be beneficial for um, the renewable energy goals in the future. So uh, just wanted to put that little tidbit of information in there that we did have some existing storage before we even started talking about this as a state. Okay, so this is where the actual analysis happened. And the main analysis that was done at the super de at a super detailed level for this uh, for this project was broken down into two. Uh, one was behind the meter. Think of that as consumer uh, commercial uh, applications and solar plus storage. <coughs> excuse me, uh, which is large scale um, hybrid storage and solar projects, um, essentially designed as an additive component with a uh, to a renewable energy power purchase agreement. Um, so these are really two completely different applications. And then we broke down the economics of each and how they would go about. Um, I'll give a really brief overview of those up next. So for behind the meter, the gist of this, I'm not gonna go into the numbers here. I could, there's a lot going on, but um, at the end of the day, if you look at the bottom, you can see that in the current, um, current outlook of Pennsylvania, there's basically no benefit for putting storage behind the meter. Um, under current retail rates, we there's the consumer doesn't gain much in terms of a monetary value from that. Um, so we need to suggest that there's rate reforms uh, that could unlock their full value. We At this current state, it's just something that we couldn't really recommend monetarily to commercial commercial users of storage. Next slide. Okay, sorry, I was like, I don't know why I screen froze there for a second. Um, as for the uh, storage, the solar plus storage analysis, there is some benefit here. Um, and I think David actually touched on this quite a bit. Uh, there's some resiliency benefits. There's also some um, benefits for uh, modulating voltage as well that I, I know is not covered on this slide, but I wanted to at least highlight some of the things that came out of that. Um, that being said, the I'll say the immediate benefits that we saw to out of this analysis that we thought could be implemented in Pennsylvania was in the solar plus storage at the um, at the generation level. Um, I for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into details on that. And if you do have specific questions, uh, you can refer to um, the actual assessment itself because it goes into great detail there, or you can reach out to me. That works too. Um, but want to at least say that that was a successful piece. Next slide, please. And this is just kind of a visualization of a, of a point I pointed out earlier. Um, there's uh, storage and not storage. There is uh, energy that can be produced and stored uh, that can be used during peak hour usage. Um, as you can see during the day, especially in summer as this graph is showing in July, uh, you can use a lot of energy. You can, you, you're using a lot of energy during the day, but you can also make a lot of energy too with solar because that's peak solar time. Um, that energy then can be stored in batteries and then used for uh, honestly the same time of day if it makes it overnight or 
be used during just programmed to be used during peak hour usage in general. Um, so the the concept here is that um, PV projects are being paired with battery storage um, as a means of better matching load for customers and the grid. So uh, in terms of barriers, these are the kind of six categories that we broke our barriers down into. Um, one being state policy, another being technology, uh, wholesale markets, permitting and interconnection, distribution, utility planning and procurement, um, and then retail tariff design and customer programs. I'll touch on some of these very briefly um, because I know there's a lot of details here, but wanted to at least give you that overview. Um, state policy is probably the first one that comes to mind when we're talking about this and really what's on the forefront of a lot of people's minds. Um, and one of the things that I think we want to really highlight is uh, establishing a procurement or a target goal for the amount of storage uh, by a given time in the state of Pennsylvania. Largely, this is done by a policy office or a governing the governing body, um, and we can kind of give our input and let and and say what we think that number should be, but we can't as the DEP set that goal. Um, but we believe that's a really important thing that some other states have already done that we think we should be doing to kind of. Uh, I'll say, put this at the forefront of the discussion. Um, another thing that we are actively working towards, <clears throat> excuse me, is uh, designating some public funding to accelerate the storage deployment. Um, we're looking into this. We have some, uh, I'll say, some avenues that we can go down to make this happen. Um, and it's something that we're actively talking about now. And it's actually an active conversation in the, or has been one of the conversations in um, the solution to the third state policy issue, convening a statewide storage issues forum. We did do this immediately after coming up with this assess assessment. We call it the Energy Storage Consortium, where we bring in experts across um, across the this Commonwealth to uh, to talk about storage and really understand some of the main issues there and what we can do to focus and be better as a, as a state. Um, another thing that we I focused on and we also have projects actively and had previous projects as the state um, do as well as accelerate microgrid development of critical facilities. Kevin is int intimately familiar with that. Um, I think that uh, we I, I don't think I know this. We have other projects going on for this, but that is something that can um, really increase uh, resiliency for those critical facilities. But it's something that we can do immediately to say, yes, this is the benefits for um, putting in putting in storage at your facilities. For the sake of time, I think I'm going to just um, not go through the rest of the policy, the, the rest of the recommendations here. I think I'm running over a little bit unless, Matt, you think I have some time to do so? No, I think you have some time. I think oh, it's okay. Fine. Okay. Um, oh, we flew through. Okay. Um, so another broad category here is the retail rate design and customer programs. Um, what Like some of our other incentives, uh, like Act 129, things like that, that are not really storage related or anything, but something like that. Um, establishing direct incentive programs for storage projects is something that we think would be um, very beneficial. Offsetting that initial cost um, for storage is only going to make that payback period or just frankly cash out the door uh, a little more a little more appealing to those large scale customers. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I did touch on this earlier, but enacting retail rate reforms and retail customer programs are things that um, we feel that are going to be necessary to make uh, to make um, behind the meter stuff, behind the meter storage much more appealing economically. Um, it's it's something that is going to directly affect that that profitability line if we can make those things cheaper. Um, as for wholesale markets is, is another factor of this. Um, we want to adopt multiple use applications framework, um, seek wholesale market improvements through this PJM stakeholder process and consider changes to um, resource adequacy rules and oversight. Go to the next slide. So we kind of lumped the last three into one big slide here. Um, we feel that uh, distribution planning and procurement processes need to be streamlined. Um, 
in general, I think because storage is kind of energy storage is really on the forefront, especially battery technology is on the forefront of kind of technology. And that's why they're all really kind of lumped together in this slide. Um, it's something that isn't necessarily being taken into account as, as the wide scale across the state. So um, enhancing that planning is something that we feel that's really necessary. Um, and these tend to be longer term goals as well. Um, because these are things that are going to take time to reform and things like that. So these aren't necessarily the ones that are the most immediate that we feel that we should be taking. Um, streamlining permitting and state and local levels. This is going to make it easier for access for um, consumers and frankly, uh, utilities as well to um, actually get storage projects through the door when they deem it uh, economically possible. And then update the interconnection process for distributed energy resources, essentially making it easier to connect to, to the grid. Um, and probably the thing that we are can do at every step of the way is uh, supporting research and development of new st energy storage technologies as well. Um, this is something that, and if you're following the news, and I saw a couple of comments earlier that you're talking about the, the new Tesla batteries and things like that. Um, there's plenty of new technology out there, and especially even since 2021, I know there's been some, some developments in solid battery technologies. Um, in general, it's something that we should be incentivizing to keep pushing forward because as the technology continues to mature, one, that means the existing technology probably gets cheaper because of better manufacturing. But in addition, we can push the boundaries of efficiency of storage as well, um, which is only going to make the, the case better for uh, storage in the long term. So that's something we, we plan on doing and continue, continue to do through the, through the time of um, us being interested in storage. I think that's the end. Yeah. Thanks so much. That was oh, fantastic. Thank you. No, that was great. And especially as, uh, as you're battling, uh, through, uh, through an illness, uh, definitely appreciate you taking the uh, time. And there were a few questions in there. I think you, you really did a good job overviewing and, and, uh, sort of broadly describing the, the landscape. So thank you so much. And I think there are a few questions that folks had that were specific. Um, but I think you touched on them. So I think we can, uh, move on, uh, unless you want to add more detail and your responses in that Q and a Garrett, uh, feel free to. Um, but uh, moving right along, uh, thanks again, Garrett. Fantastic presentation. Um, uh, moving on, uh, we have joining us today as well, Kevin Wright, uh, who is uh, president of Protogen uh, Energy. Um, Kevin is an energy business leader with expertise in evaluation, design, and implementation of resilient, sustainable business solutions and management practices, has a passion for renewable energy, market transformation, and implementation of innovative uh, energy technologies. Uh, he's a founding partner of Protogen and charged with implementing the team vision and strategy. And today, Kevin's going to provide us with an overview of microgrid feasibility analysis that uh, Protogen conducted uh, across Pennsylvania. So, uh, Kevin, I'll let you take it from here. Great. Thanks, Matt. And thanks for uh, giving me the opportunity to share the work we've been doing uh, with the EP around the state. Do you, do you have the presentation there, Matt, or would you like to, me to bring it up there? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. We got you queued All up. All right. Gotcha. Appreciate that. Uh, so again, just jumping into this, go ahead and just jump to the next slide. Want to do this, uh, really want to give folks a flavor of what um, is going on. Um, back in, uh, it was late 21, 22, P, uh, the PADEP um, launched a program called Improving Critical Facility Energy Resilient with On-Site Generation and Storage. Um, Protogen, myself in particular, we've uh, re just renamed that, they're microgrids. Um, so the goal of this program was to, um, to conduct outreach to critical facility operators around uh, the Commonwealth. This included municipalities, uh, municipal authorities, county governments, uh, those types of folks. Um, the, uh, there was a, a series of PowerPoints and presentations that were given webinars and uh, folks were able to apply uh, to have their facility um, included in a no cost uh, feasibility study to assess um, the use of, well, every type of technology. We considered all energy types, all fuel types uh, in, this, in this program. 
And um, what we're going to do, you know, what we did is, is we went through this, we were looking to increase resilience. So this is operational assurance, event ride through, FEMA lifeline support, these types of things. Um, there was a clear goal about reducing greenhouse gas. Um, and then where possible, we would look for opportunities to increase the economics um, uh, for uh, the, the host site. Uh, the quick summary here is that we looked at 12 sites. Uh, we defined about $35 million of microgrid projects. Um, the most challenging thing from a development perspective was data collection every single time without fail. Um, and the biggest challenge in terms of implementation is funding, which is really what Garrett was just saying. Uh, so I don't want to bury the lead on any of that. Um, but that to say, we had a lot of very successful projects and several of them are moving forward. And so just want to run through a quick, just a quick overview of the projects, give you all a sense of the types of sites we were looking at. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, format is the same here, just a quick visual overview and a picture of the load profile. Um, servicing loads um, in a microgrid configuration, for those of you that aren't maybe familiar with what a microgrid is, um, or a nano grid, as some might uh, refer to in this picture. This is a, uh, a load or a group of loads behind a defined boundary uh, that has the ability to connect and disconnect from the grid, uh, the, the greater grid, um, and power itself with on-site generation. So it could be, you know, natural gas, it could be solar, uh, it could be, you know, hydro, it could be wind, it could be a range of fuels that power that uh, system. This was a typical uh, respondent. Um, this is a firehouse. Um, these firehouses uh, have, have continually risen to the top in the type of, of um, folks that were interested. These are great for community resiliency because they typically are already a public gathering space. Uh, lots of these folks do banquets. They have showers, they have bunks, they have facilities uh, where they can help to support their community uh, through uh, you know, a long duration um, outage. Okay, moving on. This was another one. This was a, a wastewater treatment facility. Um, and the distinction here, um, these are tough, um, right? Most of these facilities already in Pennsylvania have diesel backup systems. And so a diesel backup system is not a microgrid because the diesel, uh, when it operates, is separated from the grid. It's isolated from the grid. This is a, the distinction between a backup system and a microgrid system. Backup systems never put their energy into the grid under normal conditions a microgrid would. We looked at this facility, they had the chance for a biodigester, the plant manager was not interested in that. So um, bio biogas generation was off the table. We looked at, uh, there was actually a small stream in the back. We looked at a potential hydro project, but it would have been a five or 10 KW type thing, not worth it. Um, and we were able to fill out the site with some solar, as you can see, um, but, this load profile, you see how it's just kind of a square block. These are very challenging profiles for solar and batteries. Um, so as we think about how we're going to you know, remove carbon uh, from our uh, electric here in Pennsylvania, we need to think about these profiles. Where you see this, you're going to need something in addition to solar to make it work. Next one. Okay, this was uh, another really interesting application. Um, this was a 911 center. We had two of these in the portfolio. Um, and 911 centers uh, by nature are already very resilient. Uh, they universally had uh, diesel and UPS systems. This makes it very challenging to add value. Um, we, we enjoyed the challenge, but you can see here, this is uh, that building with the, the tower on it. That is the south facing side, that is the roof. And for those of you in the solar industry, you should immediately realize that's a tough solar candidate right there. Um, so we really had no ability to add a renewable directly to the site. Uh, what we opted for instead in terms of a recommendation here was a virtual net metering system uh, for the county. Uh, and we defined uh, you know, the system sizes that they would need actually to net out 
the whole county uh, and they would have the ability to do that. So the recommendation for resiliency, we didn't have one. They were really uh, well built out, but we had a great recommendation uh, for, uh, uh, for the whole county. Next. This was a um, one of three sites within a community in Pennsylvania. This was a borough um, hall. So this was a fire station, the police station. This is where, you know, it's a critical facility. You need to keep this running through emergency events. Uh, this facility in particular had a lot of challenges. Uh, if you can't see it easily, there's a lot of shading on this roof. So not good for solar. The other challenge is that it was co-located with, uh, I was right next to a river uh, and this site floods. So this is a challenging spot. You don't wanna make your last stand resiliency facility in the place that you know will flood uh, and again is shaded. So this, this one ended up being kicked out. Next. Um, elsewhere in the town, we were able to identify a community facility um, and uh, we were able to site uh, sufficient solar and energy storage uh, there is natural gas available at this site, um, <clears throat> but uh, the community uh, was was not interested in natural gas and they only wanted to consider solar. So that's what we gave them. Uh, and this would serve, uh, you know, as kind of an auxiliary location for uh, the previous one we just saw. Next. And then yet another location within this community, this is a public works facility. Um, and what this uh, facility did, this is in a city. And so finding open green space in a city is tough, but um, finding open green space that isn't, you know, a playground uh, or a park or something like that is also tough. This worked out here and that this site could, uh, could house ample solar generation um, where they could one, have a resiliency structure, which was great. Um, but then they also were able to leverage virtual net metering. This is one of 13 strategies uh, that we've identified for implementing. So virtual net metering, uh, community solar, there are a bunch of them that are great for uh, in enabling microgrid systems. And so that was that, was that one. Next. Uh, this is a drinking water facility we looked at. And uh, for the technical folks, you wanna look at that blue, um, energy chart, it's, it's a block. It's a, it's, and when you see that, you know, what that automatically triggers in my head is that this is going to be a tough one for solar and batteries. That's because the load is constant day and night. It's their pump loads. Right. And so here we had a very unique opportunity uh, to evaluate solar energy storage and then natural gas um, as well. And so uh, uh, again, for those of you in the industry, you'll see that there's that big green solar array that's kind of in the tree area that's across the street from the facility. This one had a very interesting service. Um, you know, normally you would see that and not think that how, how would I build all this in that meter it? The service entrance was across the street already. And so this one was very, very unique. Um, had a lot, has a lot of potential uh, to, uh, again, to deploy solar and natural gas in a complementary way. Next. This is a campus system um, that is uh, police and fire uh, EMS for a county. And so when bad things happen, this is where the county will, um, this is where they run their operations for, for both police and fire. Um, this was a, a facility that had substantial infrastructure upgrades in the planning stages when we uh, were brought to the project. Um, what we were able to do here is come up with solutions to complement uh, their plan for diesel generators. Uh, again, for those of you who haven't been too deep into this topic, diesel is king in the resiliency world. It is just about everywhere, um, but it also has some limitations uh, in a long duration outage, you know, for for folks that are familiar, Hurricane Sandy, where you have three and four and five week outages, uh, diesel fuel rationing and allocation becomes a burden for governmental bodies. And so to the extent that we can reduce the runtime of our diesel generators, that provides operational flexibility for folks that are dealing with these challenges. And that was really what our goal was here. Um, where we're able to look at a microgrid system, again, in a, uh, a campus application, solar energy storage, 
uh, and diesel. Uh, this one had a, a, a nice and friendly load profile that was easy to handle. Next. Um, I think we, did we skip one? Yeah. So this was a senior housing facility um, that uh, we were able to come up with another great solution. Again, this was offsetting diesel, which was the key backup here. Um, has a big peaking load in the summertime. So that August 22nd, July, a lot of air conditioning, and you can see how the load drops off. That's because they're heating the building with natural gas. So maybe an electrification play for some of you out there, but this is a combination of solar energy storage. We had to go into the parking lots and look at canopies. Canopies are expensive. Um, that's the most expensive way to build solar. Um, but it's also a great way to uh, to utilize that open space. Next. Um, did we, yeah. Uh, this was, a, uh, again, this was a drinking water facility. This one was a, had incredible potential. Um, there's a lot of politics behind this one. It would probably never happen, but uh, this is a, a urban environment that had, this is the largest urban solar array potential I've ever seen uh, in the Commonwealth and I've been doing it now 27 years. Uh, this one's a real shame. I'd love to see it happen. Um, you know, this could be, you know, 15 megawatts of solar in the middle of a city uh, on land that can't be used for anything other than solar. Uh, so uh, this was, a, again, solar energy storage and diesel for a drinking water facility. We weren't allowed to show the uh, load profile. That's why it's not there, but it's a block. Next. Okay, this one was a, a tough one. I'm showing you the good, the bad, the ugly. You know, I wanna share the lessons learned that we've all paid for here in the Commonwealth. This was another fire station, um, has a reasonable load profile. They had a diesel generator already. We were looking at ways to augment or replace that. Um, so we looked at solar, we couldn't get there. Um, they were not interested in canopies. Uh, they thought it was going to hinder, you know, the flow of trucks and um, uh, protection equipment in and out of the facility. We only had access to the roof uh, and there's just not enough roof uh, to, uh, to put enough solar on the site. So uh, we offered this solution just as a grid tied solar system with uh, no, uh, no energy storage. Next. Uh, this was another firehouse. Uh, this one had a great solution. They currently had a propane, 100 kW propane generator there. They were very interested in, um, you know, looking at something that was more sustainable. Uh, so we gave them a couple of options here to consider. Um, there's, there's actually two solar arrays there that they could do one or both if they wanted to. Um, and uh, this project is moving forward, uh, as was the very first one. I should have mentioned that um, uh, towards uh, towards construction. So um, next. And then just uh, a shameless plug separately um, from the DEP projects, but with support uh, of DEP, um, we've received uh, $500,000 of funding through um, the DOE Net Zero Microgrid program and uh, with support from Idaho National Labs. And we've been working on a concept here in Pennsylvania. It's now bleeding into uh, New Jersey, which is a, a, an energy resiliency corridor concept. This is really about aligning um, community and transportation microgrids along a major transportation artery uh, through population centers in Pennsylvania. Um, and so this study is looking at kind of a range of technologies, a range of applications, and also looking at the idea of hard connections between microgrids as an alternative backbone um, architecture to the existing distribution system. So the way we think about building distribution and transmission today uh, is a thing. Uh, this, is, this is exploring an alternative to that methodology um, where we would uh, refocus um, our planning based off of our resiliency needs um, in terms of, uh, of community microgrids and uh, that kind of thing. So uh, just quickly from the top, there's the LCTA. This is the Luzerne County Transportation Authority. Uh, there's an awesome um, uh, 
natural gas bus refueling project that's happened up there that's complemented with solar, bringing together uh, those two technologies. Uh, electric buses were explored, didn't make sense. Uh, we are evaluating hydrogen production for a couple other reasons uh, up there. More to come on that. Here in the center, the community microgrids, these are municipal utilities. So they have a unique regulatory um, treatment. Uh, we call it regulatory arbitrage. So the uh, investor-owned utilities, PICO, PPNL, they're tough to build microgrids uh, in those territories. Municipals have a lot of leadway. We have 35 in the state. There are four that are co-located along this corridor. And of course, we have the Philadelphia Navy Yard, which hopefully many of you are familiar with, but Rudy Terry and those guys down there are doing a great job um, continuing to build that out. And then moving into um, uh, Atlantic City uh, and near Atlantic City off the Atlantic City Expressway, there are two projects uh, there. One is a community uh, and the other one is visioned as a transportation uh, microgrid. And so that is, uh, that's what we're working on. Lots of cool stuff. And uh, thanks for your time. Thanks so much, Kevin. That was fantastic. Kevin, was I just fun. have one question for you, or a couple questions. Um, sure. What What do you think the challenges are with the investor-owned utilities for microgrids? Uh, it was a little bit easier in the... Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean I, I, uh, a simple answer would be deregulation is the problem. I mean, you know... Uh, the other one is a microgrid tariff could solve it. We're, I, that's that's the workaround in other jurisdictions that we're in is, is you know, we need a microgrid tariff. We need a mechanism uh, that folks can interact with utilities at, at that level. We don't have it. So there's just no way to do it. This is the problem we've had in, in Atlantic City, uh, which is, you know, the, kind of the same as Pennsylvania in a lot of ways. Um, and so... Um, yeah, that's the biggest challenge. A microgrid tariff would be an awesome win. Great. Thank you. And somebody did ask um, if, I'm just going to direct this to you, if you could speak to the technical interface between a utility and a microgrid, maybe this, and this is probably sort of what you're getting at. Is, is my assumption correct that if we install reverse power flow protection technical equipment that keeps up uh, from flow? from flowing power back into the utility grid that we can avoid a utility grid interconnection queue? Um, well, if you want to build an asset that's going to operate at any time with the utility, it has to go through their process. If you want to, um, you know, exist without the utility, you could, you could probably avoid the queue that way. But, um, I don't think there's any way if you ever want to be connected to the grid, whether it's to collect, you know, AEPs or anything like that, or net meter, uh, you'd have to go through their queue. Right. That would be my assumption. Sorry, Matt. Go ahead. Take it away. No, no. <laughs> thank you, Kevin. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Kevin. That was fantastic. Um, and uh, wrapping us up today, uh, we have uh, uh, another uh, member of the business community, uh, Chad Fitzgerald from uh, EOS. Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald is Vice President of Strategic Partnerships and public affairs at EOS, where he leads state, local, and federal government relations activities and key partnerships that span uh, EOS Energy Platform. Uh, Mr. Fitzgerald was previously managing director at the investment banking division, or in the investment banking division at B. Riley Financial, where he built a successful 20-year track record in raising capital for alternative investment funds, and in particular, with particular expertise in growing emerging, market, emerging markets. Um, Chad's going to speak uh, about what EOS is doing now uh, to grow more electricity storage capabilities locally uh, and helping to grow our domestic energy supply chain. So, Chad, I'll let you take it away from here. Sure, thank you. Um, so let me just kick it off on some of the, so it's funny, uh, Sharon and Matt, uh, thanks for having me. I, I very quickly need to call Kevin and David and Garrett and lots of other people that are on this to uh, spread the word about um, where our business stands and what it means for energy storage. So um, the one thing I would want to, to emphasize though, Sharon, I know you are you really understand this, um, the, uh, the lack of a robust or aggressive mandate on the energy transition. Um, 
is just not something that puts Pennsylvania at a disadvantage when it comes to um, the energy transition or resiliency. One of the key things that I think our company shines a bright light on is we are missing an opportunity to recoup, recoup Pennsylvania tax, tax dollars that are pouring into Washington and then pouring back out of Washington into the states. And without having the uh, similar mandates as neighboring states, you're just not getting money back that you're already putting into the rest of the country. Um, and beyond that, companies like ours that create clean technologies want to be near their customers. So if you have states with extraordinary mandates and other states with very little mandates, you're going to see a lot less economic activity associated with the development of the clean technology industry. And in the end, um, just like Pennsylvania's leadership on energy for the past hundred years, it really should fully embrace the energy transition and the economic opportunities associated with the energy transition. And when you do nuts and bolts manufacturing like us at EOS, um, that gives an opportunity for folks who are not just in the innovation economy, but are part of the manufacturing economy where you get different people from socioeconomic ladder um, all participating and thriving from economic activity. So um, it's funny, some of these mandates may seem like numbers, but they can have a substantial impact on not just the health and resiliency of communities, but actually their economic vitality. And by not being more aggressive here um, and competitive, we're really missing a lot of, uh, a lot of um, economic opportunities. So I just wanted to kind of start with that. Um, let me go to the next slide. I forget actually what we have on here. So yeah, just a quick background on EOS. So um, what's unique about this moment in time, and many of you all may have seen that we received a um, $400 million investment from the Department of Energy loan program. So um, what's interesting about that is that is the first Title 17 loan and Title 17 looks to scale emerging technologies. It's the first Title 17 loan from the DOE into an energy company, uh, an energy storage company full stop. Um, you've seen lots of different loans go to energy storage from the DOE, but that was in the advanced vehicles division. Um, so that's kind of traditional um, incumbent technologies like lithium ion. So it's a pretty big deal for us. Um, and uh, what's really important about that moment in time is uh, we now are, have been, and will further be able to produce at scale a commercially available alternative to lithium ion technologies. And we think ultimately lithium ion is going to play a central role to the energy transition as it powers mo mobile purposes. But when it comes to stationary storage, which is really just an emerging market, you're going to find a lot more technologies like ours that are uh, not toxic, not flammable, can be easily recycled. The raw materials can be sourced in the United States. Um, and they also have longer durations like our three to 12 hour duration capabilities that are even more important for stationary um, storage um, uh, applications. So, you know, when Garrett's study was being done in 2021, you may have, you may have thought it is, in his study actually talked about four hour dur durations. At that time, you know, there was a minimally available long uh, alternative chemistries like ours, but very soon, you know, we are already producing at commercial scale. We're going to be ramping that. And then there's going to be other interesting technologies coming online too. ESS, Form Energy, Ambry. There's a bunch of other interesting alternative chemistries that are ultimately coming online. Um, and we're cheerleaders for them too, because the market is so big um, that um, there's going to be lots of different technologies able to fill these voids going forward. Um, next slide. I think we might be missing a slide or two, but uh, that's okay. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, just, just to kind of touch on uh, the company's background. Um, so we spent a lot of time doing research and development and a lot of money. And um, what's really difficult for companies like ours um, is when you pivot from a research cult culture to a commercial production culture. It's really like building a whole new company in real time. And we got lucky to have excellent leadership from our CEO who came from GE. Um, and today um, we're producing at scale. We have an 80% American supply chain and, and, very, and trying to get to 100% soon. Um, and we have a ton of uh, public policy uh, wind at our back allowing us to scale. 
Um, most importantly, um, in, in Turtle Creek, where our facility is, uh, three years ago, we had two or three people working there. Um, we now have uh, over 400 people working in that location. 80% of our employees are high school educated, 50% are people of color, 25% are veteran, 20% are women. Um, all of those folks have IRAs, all of them own equity in our business. Um, and, you know, really what we're offering now for people in the Mon Valley is an opportunity. If you don't go to a four-year school, you actually have an opportunity to work in a, a long-term emerging industry that can help you earn a middle-class life. So beyond the benefits of our technology and the uniqueness of our technology to help uh, the energy transition, um, you've got this extraordinary opportunity when you make the stuff in America to bring economic opportunity to people too. Um, so I know we're kind of, uh, yeah, in our, I'll go into more detail, you know, offline with folks on our technology, but um, it's, uh, again, it's a simple design We've made it even more simple and it's helping us um, accelerate our manufacturing process and become more efficient and drive down costs safe. Um, no, no concern about fire risk. Um, this can be near people. It can be inside of buildings. There's a lack of toxicity inside the battery. Um, and it also has flexible duration. You can use this for three hour duration or up to 12 hour duration. Um, and in the end, which will be a big issue 20 or you know, 10 or 20 years from now, you can recycle this this technology very easily using um, using currently available recycling techniques. So really a breakthrough technology, but most importantly for this conversation compared to a similar conversation five or 10 years ago, it is commercially available. EOS can put these types of batteries on the ground. Um, and I think that this is gonna become even more important with, current, with the recent concerns you saw in New York, just a couple of days ago in California and other places, um, as communities get a little bit of pushback on battery technology because of concerns about fires. So we're, we're gonna be a very big um, part of that solution. And yeah, and most importantly, um, we're out in the market. Um, we're act, you know, actively being permitted into projects and um, improving the technology beyond the lab out into the field. And that's pretty much it for me, but um, look forward to reconnecting with you, Sharon and Matt sometime soon and with a lot of the folks on the panel and uh, hope to hear from people um, from the audience. Well, thank you, Chad. We're so, um, you're such big cheerleaders for EOS and we're very excited that you're located in the Pittsburgh area and as we are too, but um, also in Pennsylvania. So we wanna, we do wanna see more of your product um, across Pennsylvania. So we'll be working hard on the policy and hope everybody on this call is is doing that as well. So thank you so much. And I just wanna thank all of our speakers for being here today. And um, this is a great and new, it's sort of new, but it's growing up so fast. Um, and we're really excited to be exploring this with, with all of you here today. And we'll be sending out some of the links that we had um, that came up during the webinar today as, in addition to our action alert. So we do encourage you to get involved um, as much as you can with your legislators, call them. You know, we can send our action alert, but calling them and meeting with them is very powerful. They don't hear from a lot of people. And um, we need a lot of support to move this forward. So we do hope that um, that you do get involved in that way. And Matt, did you have any other uh, comments that you wanted to leave folks with? Call your legislator. That's a good one. <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. And have a wonderful, wonderful uh, fall equinox this weekend. Um, and enjoy. I hope the weather is nice where you are. Take care. Bye-bye.